you guys, it's your friendly analytical professor here to give you a summary of error. So let's first start with the question of what kinds of error are there. Um, importantly, we have systematic and random error. So how do you distinguish the two? The important characteristics are that systematic error affects accuracy and random error affects precision. We always have random error as long as we're making a measurement. So the most important thing is that we always want to get rid of any kind of systematic error. And this means that by definition, we can, in theory, identify and eliminate systematic error. Um, so it means that we've got bad accuracy. Example would be miscalibrated equipment. And one of the characteristics of systematic error is that it's always reproducible in the high or low. So if you are going to measure a sample multiple times, you're going to find that you get this value. But actually, that's true. It's reproducibly high. I always measure it up here. Alternatively, it might be always reproducibly low. Um, random error that affects precision, you can't eliminate it, unfortunately. You can try to minimize it by careful work, but you can never get rid of it entirely. Um, and this simply comes from uh, the chance that sometimes you're going to be a little bit high or a little bit low. So it's usually a Gaussian distribution, and if our true value is here, sometimes you're going to be high, sometimes you'll be low, and you end up building up this random statistical value around it. Now, when we talk about error propagation, which is where most of the questions come into with this topic, usually what we're talking about is we're talking about precision. We assume that any kind of issues with accuracy have been gotten rid of. And there are a lot of ways that you can do that. You can get rid of accuracy using standards. Um, or sorry, you can get rid of problems in accuracy. So you can ensure your accuracy and get rid of systematic error using standards. Um, you can do multiple methods. This is all of our method validation work for chapter five. Um, but right now, let's stick to chapter three. So one of the few things that you do want to realize is that there are times when we have known systematic error and we just have to work with it. So I'm going to draw a little box around a random error and indicate that we're going to talk about that next. But there are a couple of known systematic errors. One is uncalibrated glassware. And we talked in class about having glassware with some precision on it, some tolerances, and that you can go into chapter two and you can look at the tables for, say, class A glassware. And in that case, you're going to get some tolerance. Maybe it'll be 100 mils plus or minus, I don't know, 0 0.08 sticks in my mind is perhaps what one of the tolerances was. But this tolerance is not a standard deviation. And so you need to take that tolerance and you need to convert it. So we convert it to a standard error, which is going to be this tolerance divided by the square root of six. So what you actually want to use if you're ever doing propagation of this is take that 0 0.08 or whatever else your error might be from the glassware tables and divide it by, 0 .0, by the square root of six. So if we pop that in, we're going to come out with 0 0.03265. And you can keep some extra sig figs. Just put an underline under that three saying that's where we understand the error will be. Now what that means though is because this is systematic error is if I use this, I don't know, pipette or this volumetric flask multiple times over, each time I use it, it's going to be high. And it's going to be high the first time, it's going to be high the second time, it's going to be high the third time. And so we want to add our systematic errors. Um, it's possible, actually, that it could be low every time. We have no clue. Um, and so we add our systematic errors, the number n times that you use it. So if I use it three times, times this now standard error. Uh, and so we'll pop that together. Um, if I use it three times, then it's three times the 0 0.03 and so on. And that's going to come out to be 0 0.09, roughly. Um, we would want to multiply it on this number as well. But what happens is, I don't know if it was high or low, and so this turns into a plus or minus, 0 0.09. And so whenever we've got these systematic errors that are reproducible, always reproducible, um, then we will use our propagation of systematic error. The same thing 
So that's case one that we know about is uncalibrated glassware. The same thing comes into case two here, which is the periodic table, where we have the atomic masses. And because of the distribution of isotopes around the planet and the universe, it's going to be reproducibly in one geography, high or low. Carbon might be high here or low there. Um, and so this is also going to be systematic. At any time then that you are talking about one element, let's say we've got two carbon atoms, you're going to go to that periodic table error. Um, I don't remember the exact number, but whatever that is, that periodic table error, you also have to convert that by using the square root of three into what we would call um, our standard error. And then you would continue on. Um, in this case, because I have two of them, it's two times this converted error. Uh, we did that same thing here, where you see now standard error is, what's this? This is tolerance, right, which was the 0.08. So you go look up on the periodic table for the Harris textbook, find out what the error is on the atom, convert it using the square root of three to a standard error, and then you can do systematic error with it. Okay, so that's the extent of the systematic error. In most cases, it doesn't exist. Now, where things get fun is random error. And you study this a lot because random error is always present. We cannot eliminate it, and it affects our precision. So there are two ways to go about this. Um, I'll divide it up. There are times when you do have a plus or minus. So you have some estimate or measurement of how precise it is. And estimates can be from the scales that you're using. Uh, perhaps your balance, you know it's plus or minus 0 0.001. Um, maybe it's from the markings on the burette. Or maybe you measured it three times and you have a standard deviation. Other times you don't have a plus or minus. And so we're sad, but we need something to do in order to help ourselves. And this is where the magnificent and wonderful concept of significant figures come in. Um, I know Dr. Gosher is getting a little sarcastic here, but in reality, significant figures are very helpful because what they do is they help us um, describe precision when we don't have a plus or minus. So, okay, let's talk about the simplest thing. Simplest thing is going to be add and subtract. And I'm going to unstick my hand from some of these pages and start to color code things for you guys. So add, subtract, rule for significant figures is least number of decimal places. You're probably thinking, oh my god, I can't believe that she's actually doing this. So, example, 12.1 minus 8.05. You put that into your calculator and it comes out with 4.05. How do you know how many decimal places in the result to give? Well, there was one decimal place here, so it's one decimal place there. So we should round it to the tenth place. But you have to remember that fun thing because this is exactly halfway between, right? 4.05 exactly, which is you round to the even. So this becomes 4.0, okay? Um, if this was 0.51, it would round up to 4.1, but it's exactly halfway in between, so we round to the even when it's exactly halfway in between. Okay, cool. Now, color coding continues, multiplication and division. For multiplication and division, it's the least number of sig figs which means you have to be able to count sig figs. Okay, so here's a nice example. Example here is, let's say that we have 101 times, I don't know, 28.20. And we put that in our calculators and it comes out to 2848.2. How do we know how many sig figs to round this to? Well, we count. Uh, there are three sig figs here. Zero is in between the numbers, and so that's significant. And there are four sig figs here. This zero is off to the right-hand side, so that is also significant. So in the result, we should have, well, three is smaller than four. We should have three sig figs, which is one, two, three. We should round to that place. So this becomes 2850. Or if you want to be even better than that, 2.85 times 10 to the, I don't know, I always have to do one, two, three, times 10 to the three. So scientific notation helps us keep our sig figs in order. 
So that's our multiplication division rule. Um, one of the important things for you to do is to figure out that uh, when you have a mixed operation, you split it into small things and you do one step and then the other. Uh, you guys had some experience with that in your homework, so I'm not going to go crazy on that right now. Just looking for the basics. Okay. Last funky one that uh, we cover is logs and anti-logs. And in that case, the significant figures come into the description of what it is. So let's just say we take a number. Let's just say we take 8.32 times 10 to the 3. And we want to take the log of that. Well, it turns out that this right here, the 3, is the so-called characteristic. It's a placeholder. It's kind of like the zeros if you had 0. .00000 number. So the characteristic ends up just giving us that first part of the log result. So log of anything times 10 to the third is going to be 3 point something. And then the actual number here, the so-called mantissa, is where our information is. And so we expect, because we have three significant figures here, that there will be three significant digits here. And that that is coming from our mantissa. Um, this describes how far in between 10 to the second and 10 to the third is. It's a pretty large number, so we expect this to be pretty big. I put it in my calculated, or calculator earlier. There we go. That was fun. And we got 3.920. So sweet. Going the other direction, um, let's say I wanted to undo this, I wanted to get that number back. It would be an antilog, 10 to the 3.920. Well, okay, we know that the 3 was just a characteristic, so that's telling us it's times 10 to the 3rd. And then that we have a mantissa of 3 sig figs, and so I expect 3 sig figs here. Yeah, scientific notation, so I put a dot in. And when you put your calculator together, you're going to end up getting the number back, the 8.32. So that shows you the characteristic versus the mantissa. So, okay, sig figs help us estimate precision. But what if you actually have an actual plus or minus? Well, that's when you then do the propagation of random error. And because sometimes one of these will be low and the other will be high, we do the square root of the sum of the squares. When it's adding and subtracting, then it's the square root of the actual error on the first one and the second one. So. This is what's called our absolute error. Absolute error. Um, for example, if we take this and we start to put numbers to it, so it's 12.1 plus or minus, I don't know, 0.1, seems reasonable. And then it's subtracting 8.05. And now on that number, we have a plus or minus of, I don't know, 0.02. We can do this. Um, you might set off your errors in parentheses to make it easier to look at. So we know from here that this comes out to 4.05. But then the question is plus or minus what? And what you'll do is the 0 0.1 squared plus the 0 0.02 squared inside a square root. And that pops out to be 0 0.1019. And again, because we put absolute error in, this is the absolute error out. So this is plus or minus 0 0.1. This is one decimal place, that's one decimal place. And real rule of sig figs say the first digit of the uncertainty is the last digit of your number. We still use the rounding rules. So we round to the 4.0 and it's plus or minus 0 0.1. Now sometimes I might have asked you for a percent error. So what would the percent error on that be? You can say, well, what is 0.1 as a percent of 4? So you set that up, multiply it by 100%, and you're able to figure out what the percent error is. Um, and that comes out to be 2.5% error. Or you could say 3% error if we're using one sig fig. OK. Ooh, throwing the pens around. Now multiplication and division. Propagation of error. Because multiplication and division is all about relative, you're scaling something. If I multiply it by 2, I'm scaling it up. Then the relative error is what matters. And we will use percent relative error. 
So I take the same math I did here and I put some error to it. Let's say we've got 101 plus or minus 2. That seems reasonable. And then we're multiplying that by 28.20. Now we figured out that that is accurate to this decimal place, so I don't know. What shall we do? Um, plus or minus 0 0.05 seems pretty reasonable. And I know that if I put it into my calculator, 101 times 28.2, I got out that 2848.2. And then I need to know what is the plus or minus on that. So convert your errors into percent relative error. Do, 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 do. Aren't we having fun? If anything, this should make you feel a little bit more comfortable for your test. Hopefully this is making it a little bit more basic. Okay, so we've got these percent errors. Um, I put that into my calculator earlier to save a little time in the video. That's 1.98%. And this one is 0.177%. You will notice I'm keeping extra sig figs because I don't want to have a rounding error. And then you set up the square root of the sum of the squares. But now it is your percentages that you're squaring. Uh, a note to the wise, if I was multiplying and dividing many, many things, then it's fine. You can put 10 million things under one square root as long as they're all add subtract up here or they're all multiplication division down here. Uh, so there's my squared sign, it's under the square root, and this comes out to be 1.98789% relative error. I may want to get that back to absolute error, so I can put in the same number here. And so you just convert that back. Uh, because it's a percent, you need to divide by 100. And then we're saying, well, what is this? Okay, it's it's... 2848.2 plus or minus 1.9% of that. So it's 1.98% of the 2848.2. This comes out to 56.6. Uh, okay, and so now we know it's 2848.2 plus or minus 56.6. But if we have error at this point, then if all of this is error, the fact that we don't know what 5 is, it could be 6, it could be 4, means that these are totally insane and not relevant. And so we round this to an error of 60. And now what you have to do is, oh, hey, the 60s place, so right there, means that it's 2850 plus or minus 60. Or for you guys who just adore scientific notation, you put all of that into the scientific notation 10 to the power of 3. Cool. Um, what about propagation of error for log anti-log? Don't worry about it. Okay, so use the book. You can't use the book on tests, which means I probably won't be asking you a question like that on test. Um, but these are your fundamental concepts for error propagation, propagation of both addition and subtraction, and multiplication and division. If you've got these down, then you should be able to do really well and be able to put together any kind of mixed operations. All right, cheers, goodbye, and good luck.